military built it for a communication system to survive a first strike nuclear attack. Now, what you're playing with out there is a pretty nifty system, but you think you're really big and bad on your little computer with the internet and the web and talk to everybody in the world? That's kind of cool, but let me tell you something. You're only pushing less than 5% of that grid's capacity. What's in the other 95%? Uh, good question. It, there is, <laughs> in the commercial side, there is products and services coming that you're just not going to believe. Um, one of the things that we can do with this system is the telecommunications. The way the, the system worked for the military, a ground user, such as a combat soldier or a military aircraft, can look onto any four satellites within the satellite grid. Those satellites will then initiate a search system where we will start locking onto the systems. And with that, we can tell whether you're a ground base or sea base or an air base object. We can tell how fast you're moving within a fraction of one mile per hour. We can estimate your ETA, the estimated time of arrival within a millionth of a second, and all this acquisition data is occurring in one nanosecond, one billionth of a second. We're pretty fast out there with that. So anyway, once this system right here goes into effect, the first thing to happen, well, let me give you a little dates here. Um, we got the grid in at uh, the very last satellite parked in the system came online August 1st, 1991. What happened the next day? Gulf War, Kuwait is invaded. And we're all sitting there looking at this going, this is too good, God. <laughs> Somebody write who's saying a thank you card. Oh, bless his little heart. He invaded that country. See, we want to test this grid. There's, this grid is so powerful, there's no way to test it, really, unless you've got a full-scale, real, live, honest-to-God war. Okay, well, you just don't go out and invent one of those. At least some of you might disagree with that. But um, I've been hanging around metaphysical people too long. They're messing with my head, I'm telling you. I, I can't even look at the newspaper any normal anymore. My colleagues are looking at me, and they go, they'll say something, and I go, well, how do you know that doesn't transcend across the dimensional barrier to jump where you can maybe receive some kind of message from some kind of disembodied spirit out there, you know, and, and maybe give you some ideas. And they're looking at me going, David, what have you been smoking, you know? <laughs> so I said, never mind. So anyhow, I'm kind of locked in the 3D world, but um, the UFO Congress I just came from, uh, the Congress, or the meeting before that was the Global Science Congress, so... I've been pretty saturated already, and I'm, I'm starting to leak all these strange ideas. But anyhow, back to science. One of the first things we did with SCRID when Hussein did that nifty little invasion was this system could now demonstrate its capabilities. A lot of this technology hadn't been used yet. Let me explain something to you, or ask you a question. I'm sure I... Did anybody watch the Gulf War on TV? Stupid question. Who who did not watch it? Bless your hearts. <laughs> I'm with you guys. <laughs> but anyway, y'all watched the, the Gulf War and it was like one of the neatest, you know, technological soap operas going on. All this technology we have we hadn't even tried yet. It we've had different pieces of it come together about everything at one time. Believe me, we dumped everything we had at that guy. So um and you thought about it, here you have an aircraft carrier sitting out in the Gulf, Persian Gulf. It fires at a Tomahawk missile, a cruise missile. This thing goes sailing out of the ship, spreads its wings, and takes off. It's going to fly about 300 feet, sometimes as low as 100 feet off the ground, which uh, that's about the height of a 10-story window. It's going to fly about 450 miles, like what, from here to San Francisco? Is it about the same distance? Well, when you get there with it, you're going to go through Main Street and Baghdad, hook a right at the square, go down to the second street, turn left, and strike the second building on the left and go in that third window on the right. Got that? No problem. And we did. Um, see, uh, the military of, of uh, Hussein is not quite as honorable as the way we do it. They build their intelligence, central intelligence building in between a hospital and a school. 
sitting right in the middle. Can't bomb it, you know. A cruise missile can come flying in the window, and the last thing you see is somebody standing at the window going, that's it, it's all over with, and um, take out that entire building without hurting the, the school, the hospital on each side of it. So do you think about that for a minute? How do they do that? GPS, Global Positioning System, was allowed the coordinations for us to be able to maneuver through all that system. So the first thing that they did is they dropped a sergeant um, behind the enemy lines. And when he got there, um, he set up his GPS coordinator. Now he's looking out over the battlefield. Here comes two Iraqi division, tank divisions. That is about 60-some tanks and about 30,000 men. He sits there and he starts punching in his coordinates and he is driving artillery in at a one square inch pattern accuracy. One shell severs a, the turn right off a tank, first shot. At the end of the day, this man by himself, it's tough in war, he killed 30,000 people and 60 tanks all by himself. Now, people go, that's awful. Well, war is not a fun place to be. It is awful. But would you like the alternative? Would you rather have your 18-year-old son out there facing those tanks? No. We have one little sergeant sitting out there, and he'd tuck everybody out. Sergeant York, eat your heart out. So the only thing the sergeant complained about, his fingers were tired. So that's the power of technology, and it's even more powerful. This is all going through the same system you play with the internet with. Keep that in mind. Other things that it can do, I just told you, pre uh, precision weapon delivery, terminal navigation landing approach capability. You can be in a solid night landing, tremendous storms, have your navigation shot up, and GPS will take you within a 12-inch accuracy pattern landing. We'll know where you are physically within 12 inches, anywhere on the surface of the Earth in a millionth of a second. Pretty nifty. Um, they help with uh, land operations in the military. They also navigation performance and jamming the environment. I, I wish you could maybe see what the Iraqis saw on their radar when we fired the system up. Um, imagine, um, you know, it had it was everything they had electronically just started snowing out and then scrambling and making all kinds of noises. Kind of looked like a something like a frog in a blender, okay? Pretty rough. So anyway, that was, um, that's extremely hel helpful in jamming navigation. The other thing that we did, have you ever thought about it? We, in the entire war, the entire war was an air war. Basically, we, we had a lot of people on the ground, but the real assaults were occurring. We flew almost 14, 1,500 attack missions. We had a lot of pilots shot down, but only a few captured. So what's going on? When the plane would go down and crash, and even if the pilot's unconscious, the GPS systems go off, and we know where that pilot is laying on the ground within 12 inches. We send in a Delta force that obliterates everything in the area. We pull the pilot out and go home. The Iraqis think, why is the Americans doing a major offensive in this area? We're not. We're extracting a pilot. The reason some pilots were caught, they landed right in the middle of a huge Iraqi, uh, uh, Iraqi battalion, so you just couldn't go in there and pull him out. So that's why we only had just a few pilots uh, caught. So that was a really handy system. Unlike Vietnam, we didn't have GPS then. We wouldn't have lost but a, a few of our pilots. So that's military applications of the GPS system. Now enters my little crowd, and we start doing subsystems, and we redesign the modifications for commercial applications. First thing we're going to do is we hook it to aircraft. Now imagine, I fly a lot, and I look out the window and I see these planes going by, and I thought, last thing I want to see is like the nose of an aircraft coming at me. Um, so collisions can be avoided because how close can we tell where things are? 12 inches. So next time you're in a rainstorm at night coming in for a landing, and you know there's other aircraft all around you, the pilots know where everybody's at just as if it's clear day, so they can come in for a landing. Uh, other things we can do, um, vehicle monitoring, so we can tell me cars <laughs> are 
locked in a place and then tell the city governments, you know, y'all got to do something about that bottleneck over there. In this town's particular case, I don't know what you're going to do about it. You got more bottlenecks than a dog's got fleas. So, <laughs> law enforcement can use the system. You might not like this one. A, law, a guy way out in the desert, right? Locks on GPS. You go with him by. He knows how fast you're going in a fraction of one mile per hour. Hey, David, wait a minute. This is not so good. So anyway, we can take tankers out of the harbor when they're fogged in. That's uh, a real uh, advantage. And there are other systems that we're going to do. Um, now this system I'm about to, I am in the process of building right now, um, is extremely political. There's a problem with the politics of this type of technology I'm about to do, and you're going to, I'm sure you all have something to say about it. Um, right now, in the state of Florida, there are 3,000 convicted felons. You know, some of these guys wield axes and killed a bunch of people. The attorney general has to release these people. Have to. He's being ordered by the United States Supreme Court to release them. You know why? They violated their civil rights because the prisons are too crowded in Florida, so they've got to release them. And I'm sitting there going, what's wrong with this picture, you know? We're going to turn loose, you know, you know, you know, Al the Axe Man over here out on the street. I mean, this is insane. So um, I worked a deal where I'll be working with the Attorney General of Florida, and what I can do, there's this little ankle bracelet we're going to snap on their ankles, which is made of a cold rolled uh, titanium. Unless he's got a diamond laser, he's going to have to cut his foot off to get this thing off. It will send out a beaker monitoring him 24 hours a day, and we'll know where he's at within a 12-inch radius. If he commits a crime, it will also locate time, date, and place, which you can use in a court law for prosecution. So they may be walking on the street, but they're still totally under arrest. All right, that sounds pretty good. Now, you can't inject anything into them because that violates their constitutional rights. Do you know that a felony prisoner has one-third one -third more rights than you do? <laughs> Check it out. So, the next technology I'm doing, that's, I'm doing that just to get a system in place, and I'll use these prisoners for a good example. But the next thing I want to do, you might have a problem with it first, but listen, hear me out. Um, you can bring your child to me, and I will fire a little air gun, and I can inject a chip into this child's body. Now, you take your child home, and you might think, well, wait a minute, that sounds like Big Brother. Only the parents are going to have the codes, and I can create a self-repetition, self-destroying system, so if it ever tries to be activated without the proper accusation that only the parents have, it disintegrates. If you lose your code, you will have to come in, I'll give you a new code and reprogram Junior there without bothering anything in the body, and you go back out, because I don't have the code. No human on the planet will have the code but you, and we can't even extract it out. So that eliminates Big Brother out of the picture. Now, that child's out there playing in her yard, and she just suddenly, you go in to get something to drink, come back out, and your child's gone. Your little girl's gone. You call in the code, the code activates it, and we'll track that child anywhere within 12 inches on the surface of the planet. We can do it in one millionth of a second. We'll notify the police, let them 